Good morning and a very warm welcome to our webinar. It's great to see so many of you joining us today for what promises to be a really interesting session. Today, we'll be exploring some of the challenges and opportunities surrounding property, estate and asset, man asset management and how many leading organisations are overcoming and taking advantage of these with a geospatial approach. Just to let you all know, this webinar will be recorded and we will be making the recording available to you all after the session, so no need to worry about taking notes. A few introductions. My name is Ali Hughes. I'm Marketing Executive at Esri UK. Um, I'm standing in for Gilly Wright, who unfortunately couldn't make it. In a moment, I'll hand you over to the team, who I'll briefly introduce now. Leading our webinar today is Andy Williams from Land Clan. Andy will introduce our two customer interviews with Jonathan Tizard from Basildon Borough Council and also Tom Stancombe, who's from Waits Developments. We'll also be joined by my colleague Adriana Cosse. She's from Esri UK and she's our customer success team um, member, and she'll also be taking us through some technology demonstrations. Before we get going today, I want to invite you to submit some questions that you may have. You can do this throughout the webinar and we'll answer them at the end during our Q&A session. You'll see on the screen a link to Slido. You can either use the QR code or access via the URL and make sure you put in the passcode. Any questions that we can't answer today, we'll follow up with you all afterwards. So let's get going. In a moment, Andy will set the scene and he'll be looking at the trends and challenges in property estates and asset management. We'll then have interviews with Jonathan and Tom, and this will be followed with, by a discussion about how a major UK retailer is planning the rollout of their new stores. We'll then wrap up, um, suggest some resources that you might find useful, and then move into the aforementioned Q&A session. So, with no further ado, let me hand over to you, Andy. Thanks, Ali. Um, welcome to the webinar, everyone. Uh, Trends and challenges in property and asset management. Um, thanks to our hosts, Esri, the world's most important spatial software company, uh, and allow me to introduce Landplan. We're a company that uses AI to join billions of real world data points to land and property. Uh, my name is Andy Williams, and I'm sure that whether you've come to this session from a property, a planning, or a GIS background, you'll be able to take something from here back to your day job. So, as we move on, uh, portfolio management seems beset with first order problems of information management. Um, people don't keep things up to date. Uh, the file format doesn't work with that system and uh, vice versa. Uh, and fundamentally, it's hard for decision makers to make decisions on issues they know nothing about. So we've entered an era where people are turning to digital twins and to Internet of Things devices to allow decision makers when the estate is approaching certain thresholds. The question is, what are the second order problems that we can get digital twins to look at for us? Should I be fixing that or developing it? And if I change the use, what am I changing it into? And how do I measure success when my goals might be either environmental or societal? Next slide, please. So we've got first order problems in development too. Basic data availability on land ownership information is better in England and Wales, but hardly existent in Scotland or Northern Ireland. When will we really have a map of underground assets and how much should we pay for it? Um, where do the networks have spare capacity and can we get that information down to street level rather than primary substations? The second order problems in development are much harder because inevitably we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. It's cheaper to build on greenfield sites, it's great for the economy and the housing crisis, but what about the environment and what about mental health? We can use AI to optimise choices but often that's the least bad solution for a collective and no one group ends up happy. So let's start asking better questions like if I had 20 million pounds to spend on carbon reduction, where would I spend it in a way that improves housing delivery? Next slide, please. Ali. Policies are key to developments, but whether that's an extension on the back of your semi or to a strat land and a new garden village, the question is, can I build here? But more subtle policies and practices are guiding what we should be doing, what we should be developing. And things like 20 minute neighbourhoods and the MIS regulations, which is EPC to level C by 2030, 
They're making us look at the existing built environment in a different way. Should those be driving development choices? And again, Alan. I just want to finish this quick introductory session with a, a state of the union of what's possible now. Firstly, let's look at the problem, which is when grading a property for a condition, for evaluation, for insurance or investment risk, define what that property is, what rights does it have, what's its socio-economic context. The situation on the left is a real world example of a property defined by hybrid address. How do I pull attributes from that property into a model that tells me what it's worth? Click on please, Alan. On the right is land plans model of AI aligned real world data. An address sits in a building, which sits in a parcel, which sits in a postcode. And each one of those different geometries has different attributes that are relevant to that geometry alone. But once you join them together, you can understand and you can make sense of everything. The model is extensible for property management use cases as well. We can put in zones, floors, rooms, shared spaces and individual desks. You can put them in there in three dimensions and you can attach rules and behaviours to those. Uh, and that will enable us to go do more advanced property management things like cost allocation and carbon tracking. So that's a quick counter through. Um, what we want to do now is to move on and to have a look at some of our, uh, our customers and what they're doing with our with our products, with our data services, and with our application. We've got we've got customers covering a wide range of asset use classes, from retail to residential, and everything in between. Our first guest today comes from probably one of the most complex use cases, which is public sector asset management, and we could apply what he learns to almost any sector or asset class. And unfortunately, Jonathan can't be with us today because of operational commitments at the council, but he has got such a clear and ambitious vision. I wanted to share it with you all. And this, what we're going to have now is a 17 minute video stepping us through that first order, then second order problems and finishing off with a great piece on cultural change. If you want a vision for what a digital twin could be, check this out. Hello, I'm John Tizard. I'm the Head of Property at Basildon Borough Council. In terms of the biggest challenge to getting to grips with the portfolio at Basildon, I think information management is obviously the, the big thing for me. I arrived here and there was no master list of assets. Um, we did have a terrier which was uh, out of date. I wasn't entirely sure who was updating it or when. Um, I couldn't see who owns what around land parcels, for example. Um, and you know, I, was, I came in to sort of shake up the asset management system. And as far as I could see, we didn't actually have one uh, or any processes in place to manage them. So the first thing I did was speak to speak to Marcus at Landclan, um, got a demo set up. Within I think a week, we had our portfolio there on the screen, ready for us to start looking at. Embedding a corporate landlord model was you know the first job it just includes reviewing all the assets that we currently have it's looking at decreasing the number of single use assets and reducing things like revenue costs um and creating properties that are used throughout the day perhaps into the night i.e multifunctional fit for purpose in the right place and supporting those services uh, i mean as part of this you've got to have all information at your fingertips centrally located and it's updated properly um, so with Landclan, what we're trying to do is build something where you click on an asset and then through it you can see all your asset data all the costs forecast all the historic costs things like repair data at your fingertips also you can look at things like um and this is not obviously more for resi but also the commercial portfolio looking at the income expected income ervs that sort of thing uh, Crucially as well, things like EPCs and the sort of sustainability agenda, which is something that goes hand in hand with any sort of corporate landlord model. Um, having that location all in one place just makes my job so much easier. Uh, well, it means I can do my job uh, instead of just scrabbling around for information. Um, also, we've been speaking a lot to our public sector partners. So where I am, obviously, Essex County Council, who are the sort of top tier council in our area, being able to sort of see their layer of um, what they own in our borough, for example, makes those conversations with them much easier. Things for like looking for marriage value, co-locating, et cetera, is it's just, yeah, it's just easy. And actually we're having those conversations at the moment. 
Um, you know, I haven't signed anything yet, but shortly I hope there'll be some quite interesting news in that respect. Something which obviously LandClan has really helped us with. We've had some some absolute horror stories when I first joined of paying um, for roofs to be repaired for properties we actually sold. Um, you know, being able to see what we own spatially is just so so crucial. I think the classic example as well, isn't it? Cutting the right grass on strips of land, having that ability to go out and actually see what you own, check it on the floor, on the ground, so to speak. Uh, it's just it's just so crucial. Uh, and actually, if you're on the ground and you're questioning a boundary. Um, you can go and say, actually, your fence is in the wrong place. We need to start proceedings here, or we need to you know, escalate this to the right legal department. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really understand how you could do it in any other way except spatially. So having for one version of truth, uh, centrally loc located and shown in land plan and updated accordingly is absolutely fundamental. Uh, having the compliance information centrally is essential. Um, but also having sort of those indoor floor plans at your fingertips, it really supports that subleasing or sharing space. It gives us the ability to be creative but charge back. Um, it it's just something that I can't do unless it's unless you see that on your screen. It's just impossible. I think what we haven't been good at is running some net present value scenarios at the council yet. And that's something I'm keen to introduce, basically where you have an expected future cost alongside income data, and then you can quickly do analysis saying, well, actually, if we disposed of this worst 10%, what happens to our NPV? Oh, look, it's great. It massively increases it. Uh, but you have to do that quickly, you know, in one program. It Well, it avoids the, the need for expensive consultants. It means I could do it on my own very quickly. Um, and it means that the whole system speaking to each other, i.e. you've got the asset management part, we've got the rental income part, et cetera, which is where I you know, really want to be. The other huge thing for me is the whole um, development angle, looking at redevelopment options quickly and at no extra cost. We could spend an absolute fortune on development consultants and we'd get to the same answer very quickly. So, you know, landclan has got some great tools in there, you know, the land massing, having those scenarios you can quickly set up and run across different areas. Um, you know, things like marriage value, we can just look at very, very quickly. So, you know, having all our, our blocks mapped in LandCloud, for example, we've been able to quickly identify ones of, of a similar sort of age and size, i.e. two or three stories, concrete frame, because they can all have things like rooftop development put on them quite quickly. So identifying very quickly we can quickly look at the planning information on those blocks. We can quickly look at all the other layers just to get an idea of what's possible. And we could do that in a few hours rather than paying someone to go out and do it over weeks. We've mapped all our garage sites on there. And garage sites for councils and other HAs, I guess, are a huge, huge problem because you've got all this disparate estate. A lot of them are in poor condition, but some of them have got great redevelopment value. Um, but you need a sort of a holistic plan there's a lot of a lot of issues with these lots of small sites i.e access i.e might have utilities running underneath it's just so many other problems and rights of way having more than one area able to run sort of workflows on mass just makes that process so much quicker i really like that workflow sort of system you know you identify sites you then say let's take these forward let's not take these forwards let's put them in this workflow it just yeah it just allows for much quicker uh, and more efficient use of time Obviously, we're taking advantage of the government grants, um, although that's, if I'm honest, that's quite a clunky process and it's taking quite a long time. Um, the hard thing is really accurately assessing where the lowest hanging fruit is. I, yes, we know the EPC data, but I, I worry about some of the data there, whether it's up to date or particularly accurate. Um, what we really need to do is, is sort of take that Internet of Things data, data from all the sensors we've, we've got now, like temperature, humidity, air quality uh, and actually have a more analytical look at our estate and we can identify assets or asset types even which are very inefficient we can then overlay that can't we with other data um you know future future costs expected and actually come to a much more holistic view on what what's target 
Uh, and so just going on sort of EPC level to me is, it's probably not the best way of doing it, but it's the best we can do at the moment. Um, and I think there are, there are some decisions around, you know, selling certain stock, demolishing and redeveloping certain stock, which means you don't have to retrofit. Um, things like district heating loops, I think they're probably the future for social housing in certain locations with certain, yeah, you know, densities. Um, but yeah, and just making sure we've got accurate data for each property. Uh, is this one ins insulated? Where's the data showing that it has been insulated? And what about ventilation? You know, just having it all in one space in one area is incredibly important for asset management. SHDF and um, HUG, well, HUG's not for our properties, but yeah, SHDF Social Housing Decarb Fund, we've won funding for that one. We've got, I think we're doing about 450 homes in the next two years. Um, we are for the commercial and community portfolio. We're going to look at the uh, public sector decarb scheme. Hopefully, although that keeps changing every year, we'll we will take advantage of Eco Four at some point as well. If it, if there's central government money, we will try and get it. But it's it's you have to be ready for any bid. It's not something you can wait for the bid to come out and then just apply. You have to be ready. You have to understand have all your data at your fingertip because there will be quite specific scenarios now, i.e. pounds per carbon save. You know, it's, it's not a case of, well, we're just going to change all the lights to LED anymore. It doesn't work like that. You have to be very accurate and very good at measuring your output in terms of carbon. Is it just about carbon or is there a social index as well? Yeah, I think for the, the hug ones, it's um, obviously linked to social deprivation. Certain areas will automatically qualify. Um, Again, you can quickly map that on Landcan, can't you? You, can, you know exactly where they, they are. Um, so you have to respond quite accurately. Uh, same with Eco4, I believe. Um, and no doubt, wants to come out in the future. I mean, there's a big tension in social housing at the moment between obviously rent levels are going up, but not as much as in inflation, unfortunately. We were aiming for all C by 2030. But you're right, if we need to do a cost benefit analysis, say, well, actually, if we just spend a small amount extra to get to A, and then you look at well, actually what it's saving you, then I just don't think I'm there yet in terms of our our portfolio. I'd like to get there to have that sort of cost benefit analysis and make that choice. In terms of new build, yeah, that I mean, absolutely, we'll, we'll go for A or, I mean, part L is pretty comprehensive anyway now. Um, but we haven't made that decision, for example, to go for PV panels and batteries yet. Um, we haven't made the choice for heat pumps yet because we think insulation needs to come first, for example, because um, you can't really have heat pumps without insulation. It just, it, well, you can, but it, it should be a lot. It, the benefits will be so much less. But yeah, there is definitely an argument if you can go to A for just a little bit more, the savings over the next five to 10 years you know, should be there. So I think having those layers in in Langclan to see other public sector partners who we work closely with. I mean, we've we've got Essex at the moment and we're trying to get sort of the local NHS as well. That is is massively powerful because I know there's there's so many efficiencies we can make and there's so many conversations we can have about how to use our assets. You know, the big thing big thing for me is marriage value. You know, we have a couple of small sites. We know NHS has a couple of small sites. Together, we can do something so much more, you know, big GP surgery on the ground floor with social housing above, for example, to actually make a site viable. Um, so seeing, so knowing, you know, data is key here. Who owns this? Who can I speak to? And this is my proposal, rather than let's just talk without having facts in front of us. Um, I think as well, we're seeing a shift. We've even spoken to some public sector partners about office space, actually using it together almost, not being uh, we are the council you are nhs or whoever actually if you need some desks today come and use some of ours and if we need extra we'll come and use your meeting rooms and actually taking that flexibility to the next level so having been able to sort of do that clawback provisions that very accurately would be really really useful um you know knowing who's using what what space is available is key uh, and really understanding demands i.e who's been using what and who's 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 going to use what for the next five years is 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 needed 
Um, so we have to take that level of sophistication on how we're working to the next level. And we're not quite there yet, and I'm hoping Langclan can get us there. But yeah, huge, huge potential for efficiency awesome. savings. I would suggest that the best companies I've worked for, they spend a lot of time and effort on processes, i.e. work processes, how systems speak to each other and what what the, the goal of the organization is and how you get there using processes and how you can evolve quickly for business needs. Public sector and local authorities, we, we just accept this is the way to do it and just blindly do things without questioning that. And that for me is the big difference. And then when you do try and change something, it's very difficult to turn the tanker. Um, we're very, very bad at A, implementing new systems uh, and B, thinking strategically about what, where we want to go and how we're going to get there. And th so that's where the biggest opportunity is really that, you know, the efficiency we can make by constantly questioning, is this the best way to do this? How can we, how can we do this cheaper? How can we do this differently? Is this still the goal even? Have we asked the customer what the goal is here? What do they want? Um, a big thing for me was like, uh, it's a probably silly example, but the repairs contract we have, we had a 95% approval rating as a KPI. And I was just like, well, why do we have a 95, like the best companies in the UK have like an 85% approval rating? Why are we A, trying to achieve something we're never going to get? And B, is that the right figure for something? It's not, approval itself is very difficult because you could spend 100 million extra, and still only get 5% better approval rating. Have we done it on time and are people satisfied with the repairs? I mean, that to me is better. Um, so it's, it's just no one had really questioned that before. And it was endemic of a sort of culture where it's always done like this. Let's not change it. There's no incentive to change it. You know, why stick your neck on the line? Um, and that's really what, you know, with the cuts that are happening, that have been happening for a long time, that culture needs to change and shift. We have to be very clear what we want um, and we will need help on sometimes what we want but also definitely how to get there um, and I think what we're not very good at is knowing best practice because we're very insular as councils we we work in our own silos we always have it's very difficult to go get an outside view on what the real world's doing and the best ways of doing things um, so it's just about asking what is possible asking the right questions and accepting some help that actually you could do it this way or you could do it this way. Just working collaboratively. I think we've been scared of the private sector for a long time. Um, but, you know, there's so much, so much that could happen. The councils have so much data, they have so much chance to affect people's lives. Um, and still pretty healthy budgets, let's be honest. Especially for something like Landclan, if you don't use it and then ask questions and keep using it and asking questions, then it will just be another program that's not really used. Yeah. And we found that with a lot of IT things we have. Um, and I think when things get new or updated as well, staff are like, oh, but this isn't how the old system worked. And there's that culture of not being open minded or wanting to do things a new way, which is a real shame because that's where you know, we have to do that, don't we? We've spent a lot of money on a certain systems I won't mention that I hardly use now uh, have weren't aren't being used as intended so you know being able to speak to you guys every week this is what I'm doing and I have a bit of help that for me is a huge USP and a huge boon to us uh, and mm -hmm. I think it's, it's critical to the success of the program probably I hope you'll agree with me that uh, John's vision is pretty ambitious and um, he's planning for success. Uh, he's planning to use technology that he doesn't fully understand and it might not even be fully proven, but he's able to do that because partly because he, he trusts the Esri brand and he trusts the team at Langclan to work with him to implement that vision. And, you know, every piece in his 20,000 piece jigsaw gives him three choices. Do I keep it? Do I sell it? Or do I develop it? And hopefully we give him the information. Um, and the prompts and the assistance to think, yeah, those are the right choices. Um, this is where we can do the best good work based on what our vision of what this estate is for.
let's move on now um, from public sector into strategic land. Uh, and I wanted to introduce uh, a colleague, the guy that I met, uh, Tom Stankham, who has been a, a land client customer for just over a year. Um, and we have been working together to try and improve the software. I mean, as a Stratland uh, developer, clearly weights get bombarded with vast numbers of prop tech salesmen trying to tell them that they've all got the best uh, application for their particular needs. Uh, and each one of them has its own USP, which I think is something that, that Tom would, would say himself. So I wanted to get really critical um, and actually almost introspective and have a look at what we're delivering for weights right now and you know what we can do better. So Tom, how are you on? That's also a good first thing. Good night. <laughs> Hello, mate. Um, listen, Tom, what's your role at Waits? Okay, so Senior Land Manager at Waits Development, so part of Waits Group. Um, and my role is to, as you've hinted at already, really identify um, strategic land opportunities, i.e. those sites that we can take through the uh, promote through the planning system, secure consent for, uh, and then ultimately take that land with consent out to the market and sell on to uh, house builders. And we're doing that on behalf of the landowners, um, in essence. Um, awesome. well, look, how is the market? It's it's tough at the moment, to be honest, Andy. Um, it's still very competitive, um, but I would say that probably, certainly this year, the number of and, and quality of sites uh, hasn't been what it's been previously and i think there's also a combination of lots of people landowners being uncertain understandably with what's going on with the market even um well that translates equally to house builders as well in terms of mortgage market where are things going wider economy so yeah, i'd say it, it's tough at the moment thankfully we remain competitive in that tough market but yeah it's not easy well look, what are you doing to try and find try and find sites of your own yeah so that that's a combination of traditional methods and what i mean by that is land agents um bringing sites to us as you say whether that's being bombarded um i'd like to be more bombarded with you know <laughs> more more quality but um but yeah certainly land agents bringing us opportunities as well as um, more traditional methods of us carrying out site searches so days of old that would have been literally get the the paper uh, local plan out and, and scan that. Obviously, these days it's a bit more high tech. Um, and what we're looking, or what we are doing, not looking to do, what we are doing is is utilising prop tech in perhaps modernising that approach. Um, certainly using land clan. Um, I, I'd say that you know there's an example, an interim step where you had the likes of um, ProMap. You know, back in the day, and I remember when I first started, that was on CDs. You know, that's a version in my mind of PropTech, but it's so much more advanced these days. So, so we are we're using the um, the cross section of opportunities. Sorry. So, what's the number one feature you want from PropTech? Um, I think that it is it's the almost the immediate analysis. You know, helping me with the immediate assessment of a parcel of land, having it visual on the screen so that I can relate to it. Um, and it and it's saving me effectively time um, because, yeah, we do get lots of sites. The vast majority of them we actually, not use too strong a term, reject because they don't satisfy all our search criteria. Um, but nonetheless, I have to assess them in the first place. So if there's anything out there, such as an land plan, that enables me to process that bit quicker and, and come down the funnel to refined to ultimately the sites that I want to offer for and hopefully secure, um, then, then that improves. But I would say, yeah, having it on screen, the ability to record my assessment and for the the information that has led to my assessment being accurate, um, having that all in one place is key. Sure. I mean, would you say there's a USP to land plan? Uh, definitely. Um, as, as you said, in the in the introduction i think that there are different offerings out there and different different firms um will either advertise or, or they just have indirectly uh, created their own usp and they're focusing on i think that land plans is actually that it provides um a plethora of different things um i think that what it does very well is it's it provides um a site assessment tool um with a vast number of constraints that you can see on screen you can turn on off 
that's perhaps, or well not even perhaps, that is more comprehensive than offerings from others. But equally, it offers the, the site searching, the AI algorithm based site searching tool. And then thirdly, it's the reporting around all of that, whether that's um, the Power BI, you know, using the API that, that exists and pulling out bespoke reports that way, or, or indeed the, the um, bespoke dashboard that we've created. Awesome. And how, how successful has this sort of prop tech led approach been for you? Um, I mean, it's, I've just mentioned the, the AI element, the, the algorithm that has been successful to a degree, and it's it has identified um, sites that we deem indeed satisfy our search criteria and we've we've made approaches to those landowners um again as you come down that funnel you have less and less control so it's not to say that all of those landowners have, have responded um but it enables us nonetheless to to identify and make those approaches and sometimes that is a um a slower uh, version of things compared to um, land agents for example bringing us something that's more warm um and then um I would say that there is an increasing adoption from our team in terms of the use of land clan, but we're not there yet. But what there is, and what I mean by that is the the algorithm um, yeah. use the AI element. What what we do use um, through the team is prop tech to for that site analysis um, and just trying to assess really both in terms of yeah we're what what physical tech constraints affect the site which local authorities are in um we look at um how's that local authority doing performance wise it's housing delivery tests where they have five-year housing land supply all, all those factors that build up a picture as to whether that's a viable opportunity for us and, and one that we want to pursue so it's it's um it's been effective it's been successful but it is supplementary to perhaps the more traditional yeah. methods I mean, you're never going to get a technology that's going to tell you whether a particular farmer is going to sell you his field, I suppose. Unfortunately not. <laughs> be great I, mean, do, be great I was going to say, that, maybe, but... maybe that's a work in progress for you. But <laughs> at the same time, I mean, I do wonder and, and hope that um, with predictive analytics might become more of a um, incorporated there's a, there's into a, models. But that's that's a good looking down on, the line. Yeah, well, there's a good piece on data ethics in there aren't there? somewhere, I'm sure, whether we... Uh, whether <laughs> Who's for which farmer selling because he needs to look you know waste is a huge business um it, and a bit like the public sector example actually you're operating sites you're building sites out you're looking for the strap land yeah do you think there's something in land plan that can help transform the whole business um i do think so um a bit like john was saying in term, in in his video um there's having everything in one place and space helps um, and I think that um, improving with transparency visibility within a business collaborative working and I think if, if if you can see everything in one place that helps and an example of that um, is where I might be going to meet a landowner or, or a, a, their representative um, and I don't have any real track record in that locale of where I might have operated, but I can um, I can see where our construction side of the business has operated, where they've got a case study, you know, just down the road, whether that's the local school that they built or hospital, etc. And I can bring that in, and I can I can see what other parts of the business are doing, and vice versa. They can see what what we're doing, obviously, you know, to a limited degree. But yeah, I think just that that improved transparency, collaborative working. Um, yeah, he's the main. So it's a virtuous circle, really. Everybody, you've been aware, you're playing as a team. You know, if, if you haven't got strength in a particular area, other parts of the business, you can lend, you can borrow their experience, like you say, and and uh, demonstrate the credibility you need to achieve yeah. that human factor, which is the you know the sale, getting the option agreement on the piece of land. So so that's that's uh, it's really useful. But one of the things I want to cover before we sort of close is is that the um, people are worried about AI, you know. Look, consultancies, people out there who, um, yeah, you know, like yourselves, whose, whose jobs are professionals, you rely on your professional experience. Is there a concern out there that AI is going to take people's jobs? Um, I think, I think that there is a concern, as you rightly say. But at the same time, for me, I, I don't think it will necessarily make the masses redundant. 
I think it's actually um, it it helps with the job. Um, I think a lot of the process and the the analysis of such, as I said, coming down that funnel, it helps to do a lot of that heavy lifting. So it actually helps to speed the process and means that I can focus, for example, on more the human elements, human interaction, whether that's landowners, agents, councils, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that maybe it will lead to refocusing perhaps or reordering of jobs and create new opportunities in reality. Um, I think, you know, where, where do we stop? You know, you look at generative AI, I've already mentioned uh, kind of predictive analytics. That's down the future. But I think that I see it as an opportunity to, uh, yeah, to do a lot of help with a lot of the heavy lifting, create new opportunities and allow me to focus on the more human element. Listen, Tom, thanks incredibly for your time today. Um, that's been no a real quick canter through. I'd love to spend a lot longer discussing these things with you. I'm sure everybody would love to hear um, what what your experience of it all has been as someone who's seen a, a wide range of different solutions. But for now, listen, thanks very much. And no uh, please stick around and, and come and answer some of the questions on the Q&A at the end. Listen, so I just wanted to summarise some of the things that, that, um, that Tom has said. Uh, I think the number one thing that people want from ProTech that, that people ask me when I go to do presentations to organisations is, you know, what's the trust in that data? And particularly when you the one thing that you want from ProTech is for it to do the heavy lifting, i.e. to stop you having to spend time in dusty archives um, or electronic versions of that looking for information, and then you want to know that the ProTech's done its due diligence. And at Langclan, we've got a team of 15 people in the UK collecting data um, that isn't publicly available in a GIS format and bringing that to the system. And we're improving that all of the time. So probably looking forward to emerging local plans being in the system um, later on this year and the NSIP programme, so National East Significant Infrastructure Project, but also been in there by the end of this year. Okay, let's move away from Stratland now. So we can click on, please, Alan. Yeah, thanks. And let's look at retail. So we were not targeting retailers, um, and then we came across a, a case study in the in industry press. And we thought, you know what, actually our data set lends itself really well to doing retail type analytics. Also, the search tools that we've got lend themselves really well to retailers who are looking for sites or who are looking to consolidate those. Um, there are people in different parts of the, different parts of the retail um, who would need to know how big people's gardens are, where there's new houses, because we're targeting them with potentially um, DIY sort of equipment or paint or anything that goes into gardening, all of that stuff. And um, we actually what provide being able to analyze the amount of open space, the frequency of development, the house prices, the types of people that, that live in an area, because that's all intrinsically attached to our always on AI driven data. You know, we can really help these people. So what's, what follows now is just to bring that to life uh, for you is a, is a simulated conversation um, with my colleague Adriana uh, and myself, just going through you know, what the retailers want from us uh, and how we might deliver it. So Adriana, why would you expand when there's an apparent oversupply of retail space and any construction should really be challenged on sustainability grounds? So that's a great question, Andy. And the reason is that there is so much wrong space in the wrong locations. Society needs services that support 20 minute neighbourhoods because they are more sustainable and more attractive places to live. There's also a plan to build another 300,000 new homes in the new housing developments and new towns or garden villages. And there is stiff competition amongst major retailers to find sites for medium format stores of 18 to 20,000 square feet or 8,000 square feet in London. But the competition for logistics hubs is really stiff. And as a result of this competition, we pay finders fees to agents of around 1.5% of the purchase price or 10% of the annual rent. And the finder's fees for one site could be 70 to 80 thousand pounds, and we want to open 500 new stores. Brilliant. Well, how did you become users of Landplan? So we actually trialed the platform before we committed. We have used a lot of prop tech solutions that do more or less the same thing, and we really questioned the value that another system could bring. 
we got quite interested in some powerful site search tools in LangClan, but they were new concepts and we had to work with the LangClan team to understand them. And once we did, it was really exciting. We built a picture of our ideal development location using the simple menu. And we can include criteria for sites that are accessible to customers and staff in the same query. We use weights at this stage because this gives us a ranked list of the best sites in our search area, including the ones that don't meet every criteria 100%. We have 13 operational regions, and we can build bespoke searches for each region using simple variations of a template that we created in just five minutes. And that's important because the searches include property prices, income breakdowns, and planning constraints, which obviously vary greatly across the country. And what would you say are the main benefits you get from LangClan? So we can quickly assess any site brought to us by agents and see how they compare to ones that we already have in the pipeline for that town or market catchment. The search only takes 10 seconds and it gives us up to the top 20 sites in a local authority. And we can quickly judge those using the street view window and checking scores. Because the searches are saved, we can run them again and again several times in the year to see if anything has changed. One thing that really stands out is the ability to pick out strategic land developments that we want to be next to. So there's a site in Warwick that we identified during the demonstration and trial, and it's right next to a development of 1,000 new homes, and there's no supermarket within a 20-minute walking radius. Where the market is so competitive, we can bring in the portfolios of our competitors, including finding out what planning applications they've got on the go. Well, it sounds great now, but what do you want from Land Clan in the future? So we believe that the link with Esri's GIS will allow us to overlay a lot more of our own customer data, and that will help us reposition some of our stores, but we haven't yet fully explored that. We're keen to see infrastructure planning applications in the data so that we can identify new bypasses and roundabouts before they get built. In the future, LangClan may even give us the confidence to change the format of our stores, giving us the evidence and ability to assess our sites for mixed use developments. Fantastic, that's great. Thanks very much for, uh, for, for listening to that. Like I said, it was a simulated conversation, but there's some real points that we want to bring out. Uh, and it, firstly, towards the end there, we started to look um, at, at whether you can bring your own data to play in analysing um, the, the, the land available for, the, for whatever it is that you're looking for. And that's a key thing that the link with Esri gives land plan that isn't available to other prop techs. Um, we have talked to CoStar, we've talked to EGI about getting commercial real estate data into our system and they don't want to talk to us because we're competitive, because clearly they can see how we would compete with them. But that means that if, if you are an organisation that's sat there and you've got a huge CRM system or you want to tap into uh, another stream of data, direct from Experian or whoever that might be, then let those links are already built into the Esri system and we can bring it into LangClan. And then add to that, there's the fact that we do property management as well as uh, and development as, as well as site finding. So you can benefit again from a virtual circle that we talked about with Wix about how all of those different parts of your business interact with each other. And actually, what could we do that is different, that's radical, that would bring us a much better return for the investment that we've already made? OK, let's move on and I'll do a quick um, look ahead to where we are with, with LangClan. Um, we are a real world data company, like I said. Um, and if you're in investment, if you're lending, or if you're in insurance, you're probably sitting on millions, or even a consultancy, you're probably sitting on millions of data points um, that guide someone's appetite for risk. But our data services can take those historic records and wash them against multiple sources to give you an actual real world location. So rather than sat in a spreadsheet, you can see it on a map and then you can join all of that information that we've got access to to it. If you've got an address and we can get all of that information, you know, at the minute it's 400 attributes per property and counting, um, and we're just waiting to deploy. And if you plug our API into your CRM and start typing an address, you can instantly get 
the height, the, the flood risk or the crime rate, whatever the, the is you're looking for, things from the EPC, whether it's um, the actual just the, the amount of carbon or if it's the, the wall construction versus the roof construction versus the heat source. If you're looking for all those things because they all lead you to make different decisions, then that information is available there, there and then. Just type it into the CRM and out it pops. And if you just click on there, please, Ali, I think there's a build here. Yeah, brilliant. The last thing I want to, to leave you with really is, is live land availability assessments. So we can start now, because we know that the, the Schlau or the HELAB process, whatever your flavor, it's a, it's a view, it's a snapshot in time, and it's supposed to exist for sort of 10 years, but it doesn't really drive the planning process because that's separate. If we had a, a live view of land availability, it would allow us to build out the supply chain, modular house builders, um, skills, materials, get everything in the right place in the right time to do it more efficiently. So what we need to do uh, and what we're, what we're planning right now for a next release of land plan is a live SLA feature, which, which basically says what land is available, what are the flows in and out of that land, looking across all of the different data sets that we've got access to. Um, and can we come up with something which, which just increases confidence in that whole sort of supply of land? Uh, and, it's, and it's always on and always available to people. That's that's uh, the, really that's been a quick quick canter through um, through everything. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, please, Ali. The, the the thing to do is to come and have a conversation with us. There's lots that we can do. There's lots that we're doing right now, which is straight out of the box. Take it away and go and have a play with it. Um, and there's more that we can do. And we are a company that would like to work with our customers to build out additional functionality. Um, we're, we're really responsive in terms of people coming up with an idea and it can be in the system in the next release or the next two releases. So, so let's um, some links on the screen here. Please do follow them. Get in contact with myself or with uh, Ian Bailey there uh, and then and come and have a, have a talk to us. So thanks very much. Ali, we on to Q&A. That's great. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, so it was, it was great to see those real world examples that you gave there, and it demonstrates the challenges right across a whole range of sectors and how they're being overcome. So, yeah, we now move to the final part of our webinar today, the Q&A section. Um, thanks to all those who have submitted questions. It's not too late if you want to ask any of our speakers questions, just pop them in um, using one of those Slido links. Um, but I think we've got um, a couple that have come in, so let's get started. Right, so first up, um, question around NP. V stuff looks interesting. Um, this is for you, I think, Andy. So is there a possibility to use the software to understand the internal rate of return? Uh, absolutely, yes, there is. Um, it's just an equation. So all of the inputs are there uh, as long as you've, we've lined up all of your information management. So we can look at the um, investment that you're trying to make, projected costs, projected um, um, values, which we take from average values in the in the area, then yeah, you get an overall summary and we could set up an internal rate of return dashboard in the same way as we've set up one for MPV. So it's just taking all of the data and putting it into Power BI in, in the right way that you want it. Uh, and those those dashboards they're customizable for every customer. So we can we can build it the way you want it. Super. Thanks, Andy. Next question we've got is around PSD carbonisation scheme. So can you give some detail, Andy, on, on what this is, what this can do to of what this can do to support that and perhaps more broadly sustainability? Yeah, so, it, so the critical things around um, SHDF and eco four funding were the need to tag the carbon saving with additional parameters. So if that's social value, um, you know, we're looking for people in the bottom quartile of our, of the index of multiple deprivation. Um, we're looking for potentially vulnerable persons, which is not a public data set. You want to include that in your analysis and your submission for funding. Then we can tag that information to every property across the whole local authority area or to your um, your portfolio if, if it's a if it's a social housing provider. Uh, and then we can quickly pre present that back to you as a dashboard. Not just what the situation is right now, but actually we can start to do up to projections 
for you in terms of this measure would achieve a certain number of kilograms of carbon saved uh, and it would affect this group of people. Um, so that's the right place to spend that 20 million pounds or whatever it is that we've got. Thank you. And um, another question around, um, you mentioned AI search. What does that actually mean? So, look, I mean, AI is uh, is the, the, the term for, you know, we've got a lot of natural language programming and, and all that sort of stuff, which is what we help to join the data. But actually, we've got algorithms in the background which are also learning what people think is a measure of success. So I, I think I mentioned that on a couple of slides, but then actually bring it out. You know, it's critical for people to um, to say what they think is a good or a bad idea because it will make suggestions to people uh, about what's the best development to go on a particular site. But look, at, we need to record and to learn as we go along what's actually what's actually right. There's a lot of experience out there. There's a lot of people that will tell you straight away whether something's a non-starter. So we're just going to learn from that, and that's what AI search is all about. Thank you. Um, and how does Lang Clang compare with Nimbus? Another question that's come in for you, Andy, please. Uh, Mr. Anonymous is busy. Look, they, uh, Nimbus, Adozo, Dacia, Land Insight, all of these guys, they're all broadly similar. They are presenting layers of information on a map. They're giving you the ability to filter down um, that information to identify parcels of land, maybe that you um, might be interested in, um, and that's the way that they would do a search, site search. The, the huge difference, the two huge differences, I always say when I get asked this question, is the first one is integration with Esri. You can bring in everything in the Living Atlas for free straight away. You can bring in any of my, all of your own data and use that to affect the site search. The second thing is the weighting. Weighting um, allows you to bring back sites that, that didn't meet all of your criteria 100%. Um, but there might be an engineering solution or a financial solution to actually delivering on that piece of land because we're in a real danger of um, you know, running out of land that we can actually build on. So we need to consider new ways of looking at the, the land that exists there uh, and we need to sometimes make a least bad choice about what's right. So that's that's the main difference. Oh, thank you. Um, and then you mentioned there about Langclan integrating with with um, ArcGIS. How how would it actually integrate with existing um, systems? So if you if you see the workflow system in in Langclan, once you've identified a site that you're interested in, that becomes just part of a feature class, uh, and you've got a whole bunch of user definable attributes that you can put attach to that uh, feature, and you can put attachments in. You can store images. Um, you can put links to document stores. You can put all of that against that one opportunity. So let's take a use case of, say, a call for sites. Someone puts out a call for sites, they get stock that they're interested in, um, 700 sites that, they're, that, that have come back from the call for sites. Each one of those straight away gets created um, because you've, you've collected that information in, in an every system. You import it into Landplan. They go into the workflow. They get tagged with the 400 attributes. They get scored by the scoring system. Uh, and then you can add your own attributes and say what you want to do with, with that. So that feature class then just sits in ArcGIS Online um, and it can be therefore worked on in another ArcGIS Online application or in Pro. Thank you. And um, another question that's come in. Um, so how does a user know the last date of a, of a data update? But it's not something that we expose. We don't expose the metadata right now, and probably something that we should we should do. So look, I'm going to take that away as a suggestion. Um, but we reprocess the data set every day. So um, where we are talking to uh, the authority, if that's the Environment Agency, Natural England, whoever it is, and we reprocess that every day. Some of our other data sets, um, like the the planning policies data set, not is only refreshed on an annual basis. So, um, totally valid question. Thanks very much for whoever submitted it, but we will um, go in, make that metadata available to users. That's great. Thanks, Andy. Um, and the question's come in about um, is the platform based on a subscription? So, yes, the platform is a subscription basis. Um, it's a, it follows the S3 um, user model. Um, but it's also available as a data stream. 
So if you already have an existing GIS system, um, if you've already got an existing business system, which is non-spatial, but you want the benefit of spatially joined data, you can get both of those things. Um, so if you want the application, that's a user subscription. If you want the data, that's on a usage-based subscription. So if you want a certain area, you get that. If you want um, a single property with all its attributes, then we can provide it on that basis as well. So it's, it's really, really granular. Thank you. Um, I think we've only got time for one more question here. We've just got a minute, Andy. So can you embed CAD floor plans, allocate room types and extract areas from the system? So to take this one step further, could rules be entered to measure capacity? So let's go take that, break that down. So CAD floor plans, yes, you, just, you can. They need to be in the real world coordinates. Um, that's always the, that's always the first thing. So there's potentially a bit of processing to do rather than an architect's view of of the world which is you know on a baseline um and that needs to be in the real world coordinates but yes you can put put them into arcgis online uh, and then you can enter them into the land plan uh, data schema by copying and pasting from there into from arcgis online into the land plan data schema and that's automatically going to add attributes for size like like it does with every as we you know every polygon that goes into the system you also have to get um get the attribute for size and then if you build in the rule that says you know the size divided by whatever the space requirement is that you know you can get a number of units as to how many you can get in there um you know if that's residential units you want to get out of a invest in a real estate uh, that's sort of a commercial portfolio or if that's you know down to the number of desk spaces you can get in a into an office. That's straightforward. Brilliant, thank you. Okay. Um, right, let's just squeeze one more in, Andy. Um, so yeah. somebody's anonymous has said they're really impressed. So could Langclan be used That's as great. a property management <laughs> system with functionality such as condition surveys, asbestos, and statutory inspections? Um, thank you for being impressed. And you'd be happy to know that that's out of the box functionality within Langclan because you've already created all those um, surveys of the stock conditions and their asbestos and the statutory inspection information. You've seen it played over Jonathan's video. Um, that's we've created all that sort of stuff in Survey One Two Three, so it's there as a feature class, and then we can present it back to you in your property portfolio dashboard. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. So unfortunately, we're not going to have time to answer all the other questions. Um, please do get in touch if, you've, if you're a person that's asked one of these questions. Um, get in touch with a member of the team and we will help you out. And anyone else that has some additional questions that you think about afterwards, um, please do get in touch. So it's time to wrap up our webinar now. So we're dead on midday. Um, so we've done very well to stick into an hour. Um, thanks so much for attending today. We, we really hope that you found the today's session useful. Also, huge thanks to our speakers. So Andy, Jonathan um, and Tom and Adriana. Um, so it takes that's it now. So just um, thank you again. And um, we will be in, in, in touch. So get in touch with us if you've got any queries and we will be sharing the recording with you. Thank you all. Thanks, Ari. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks, Andy.